Hey everybody, spoilers for everything that was ever made. Uh, Star Trek, Succession, uh, The Rise of Skywalker, The Witcher, Skyfall. Marcus, the am Matrix. I forgetting anything? The Matrix. The Matrix, um, American Dad, Family Dexter, Girl. Dexter. Dexter, yeah. Romeo and Juliet. Romeo and Juliet gets spoiled, yeah. Uh, yeah. Aliens, Sorry, maybe? Spoiling. Aliens, yeah, he's some spoilers of aliens. There. Captain America Winter Soldier definitely gets spoiled. Anyway, you have been mm-hmm. warned. Mm-hmm. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of The Script Department. I'm John, I'm joined today by Marcus, and we're going to be talking about our pet peeves in screenwriting, so expect lots of ranting in this episode. Before we get into that, if you haven't already, do check out our website, thescriptdepartment.net, for all the latest stuff that we get up to at our global network of screenwriters, including script readings uh, from the best unproduced original spec scripts out there. Uh, Also, follow us on social media, hit the links in the description, and do subscribe to our podcast. Just search for The Script Department wherever you get your podcasts, and subscribe to the YouTube channel as well. Marcus, I like to think that every discussion we have has some sort of educational value in it, even if we're just ranting about the matrix. Um, But (laughs) I definitely think today we're on to something with uh, a kind of big red flags of ours when it comes to screenwriting, the big kind of, you know, do's and don'ts. This will mainly be don'ts um, for the kind of aspiring yeah. screenwriters out there. Uh, hopefully, if you are an aspiring writer looking to kind of hone your craft, you'll find something valuable in this. Uh, and if you are somebody already making your way out in the industry and uh, this kind of stuff seems obvious to you, uh, let us know your pet peeves because we'll start collecting them and we'll start doing them for another episode as well. So we're hoping this will be an ongoing series that we can do whenever we uh, whenever we run out of topics to discuss. Um, Marcus, we're, I've got five lined yep. up. You've got five as well and some in the bank. Uh, we'll just keep yep. going back and forth until we run out of time. What's your first pet peeve? That's right. It's my first pet peeve. I mean, what I would say is that um, these, uh, what I found, I don't know how you came to yours. I don't know how you came to your pet peeves, but I found I just was just watching TV slightly differently. I was just being with a slightly more critical eye. So I think I need to go back over a few things and... Uh, and I need to give Encanto a, a better run at things because uh, I, I kind of did pick it apart a little bit. But anyway, um, my... you can't criticize Encanto. I'm afraid. I'm sorry. Oh, I mean, I'm not, well. Well, I'm sorry. It was great. It was. Oh, don't get me wrong. I mean, as somebody I who does a, as somebody who does a lot of babysitting lately, uh, Encanto <laughs> Encanto is like our lifesaver, and I will not have anything yeah. said about Encanto or Coco Melon or Lulu Kids or anything like that. It's fine. You can. Well, you can it's fine. We'll, we'll be objective and academic about this. Go on. <laughs> Just well, I, I well then. Fair warning to the comments, everybody. Please do not be uh, slagging off Encanto. Pixar generally. We extend it to Pixar in general. Is that? <laughs> I think you could have a go at Pixar these days. I don't think they're the. I don't think they're the, the you know be all and end all like they used to be. But uh, mm. I won't have a bad word said about Ratatouille or Toy Story. Oh, one. now Rat. Um, we are veering immediately off the topic and yeah that's yeah my okay fault. back on to back on to <laughs> right back on to number five peeve. number five pet peeve for me mansplaining as a way of delivering exposition so in any and and this might be and for for those of you that perhaps don't perhaps aren't aren't screenwriters or or maybe even that are go and watch almost anything just go pick just pick something pick something randomly and i guarantee I guarantee you, you will find a moment where a man is talking about something and something that the audience may not know about, something the audience may know about, and a woman in that scene will sit there and go, what's that? And he goes, well, specialist in your field, allow me to explain to you exactly what that is. It's in everything. It's in absolutely everything, and it drives me up the wall because just be more creative about how you deliver exposition. Just be more creative about it, which is a slightly more general thing. But that, for me, mansplaining when it comes to exposition is a big, big, big deal. And it's n- number five pet peeve could quite easily have been higher up this list. Give me an example. <sighs> the West Wing Ooh. is the one that is sprung to mind. Yeah, I know you like. I know how much you like the West Wing. Eh, I can't. Think I'm not. I'm not totally married to wow. the West Wing. You can criticize the West Wing. I. I don't know, Joe. I mean, you seem pretty married to the West Wing when last we spoke about the West Wing. 
But I, I've, I've maybe. Yeah, <laughs> I spanned through. I spanned through uh, a few, a few bits of the West Wing. I'm by no means an aficionado um, like yourself, and so I can't. I'll be honest with you. I can't think of the the, the specific thing. But that mo- there was a moment in there when there is a she is so high up in the White House. So high up in the White House, this particular character, and she and she says so. It's just it's just unnecessary. She just wouldn't say. It's just it's just some. She asks a question that just would not be said. It's a bad example. I can't think of another one right now, but I guarantee it happens in almost everything. <laughs> okay, okay. I've not. Uh, I've, yeah, for, it's not. I've for not. The guy, for the guy who said, <laughs> for the guy who was like, it is everywhere. Yeah, uh, I can't quite think of a yeah. specific example. I, no, it's well, okay. I'll take write. I'll take your word for it. No, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. It is, it is. Um, I think it is a big issue in in storytelling where I think the old cliche was that the expert was the male character, and mm, and even as they start, even as writers started to diversify their characters a little bit it's still always boiled down to and maybe it's something to do with the the fact that the protagonist or the hero of the piece was all, always tended to be male in those types of you know in 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 stories where you would have these kinds of things yeah i, I know exactly what you're talking about all right i haven't done them in any order but i okay. will i will i mean they're all just kind of things that drive me mad so a big one for me is lying to your audience um Ah. And I did a blog post about this years ago with, uh, when Captain America, the Winter Soldier came out. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a scene in that where a character gets killed and, or you believe the character is killed and they show the character lying on the slab and then it turns out the character is not dead mm-hmm. later on. And it's such a stupid way of writing that scene. And I say stupid because it is you thinking you can get one over on the audience. First yeah. of all, we know that character is contracted to a lot more movies. That character isn't going anywhere. Um, sure. And, you know, you thought you could get one over on us. You thought you could kind of build an entire first act of what is a, like a two and a half hour long movie or something around yeah. this around this whole th- kind of character's supposed demise. And... It's all done to just incite, you know, it's, it's, it's not, I don't know if it's the inciting incident of the story, but it is done as something like, oh, we've lost our. It raises the stakes, doesn't it? It, it, yeah. kind of, it, it, it raises the stake and it, and it, and it, and it forces, um, it, it forces the your Captain America and um, Black Widow to kind of go out on their own without, without that protection that they've had. Yeah, yeah. Without but it, know, giving away but, who it is. But, but it's all for nothing. You know, yeah. and, it, and it doesn't have any way to it because we know, I mean, yeah, you could buy into it, but there's the other thing is that there's no value in it of, on repeated viewing mm-hmm. because you're not you're not going to be moved by this stuff. You're not going to be moved next time you see it. And I think a great example of that done right is in Raiders of the Lost Ark when uh, Marion is running away from her pursuers out in, in the um, I think it's in Egypt and she she jumps into a, a, a basket and then the basket yeah. gets hoisted up by somebody and brought into a market full of baskets and Indy, you know, <laughs> Indiana can't find her. And then he hears her voice, chase her down in her alleyway and then sees baskets being put on a Jeep or on a truck. He shoots at the truck to try and stop it. It veers off, it explodes somehow. And then she, he believes that not only is she dead, but that he played a role in her death. And yeah. he grieves for her then for a few, you know, for a few scenes. Um, but we didn't see her get put into that truck, right? The difference between that and Captain America is we saw him get figuratively put on the truck, so to speak. Um, yeah. And, you know, you can't have these two highly intelligent characters staring down at this supposed dead body on a slab in a morgue and thinking, you know, oh, wow. You know, because it just makes, well, you're not that intelligent then, are you? Uh, you know, if you, you yeah. surely you've seen this in a playbook somewhere, you know. Yeah, hundred um, percent. And yeah, and so it's just that idea of you can deceive the audience, like they do in Raiders. Mm-hmm. This isn't de- this isn't deception. This is yeah, just sure. it's lying to us. You know, yeah. it's it's, just, it's yeah yeah yeah. 
It's the equivalent in Raiders. It's like I've put a ball under one of the cups and I'm moving the cups around on the table. And you have to guess which one it's in. And I'm using sleight of hand to get rid of the ball. You know, mm-hmm. in, in Captain America, it's like they literally swapped out the cups for different cups. You yeah. tried to convince yeah, yeah. you you didn't see that, you yeah, know, I'm and it's you. like, no, no, I'm, I'm smarter than that. Um, yeah. And the other thing as well, that, it's, you know, the, sorry, go on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's, it's not playing. It's not playing the game. Is it? Yeah. You know, like a, a a film, a film, you know, like that. Most most movies are, you know, you, you're playing an. It's an investigation. It's an an investigation. An investigation. Why can't I say that word normally? It's an investigation, and you know, and it, and it's a mystery, and you and you and you know, you're playing the game. You're laying this breadcrumb uh, trail mm. for the audience to pick up on, and and you know, can you work out what's going on? Whether it's you know, whether it's like a who done it or or. or or a Marvel film, you know. Yeah, that's it is. exactly that particular Marvel film. In, in is, it's a spy. It's a spy film, right? Yeah, so yeah. you're not you're not playing the game properly, and you're not giving the audience the chance to actually. Engage. That's what it is. It's like it's like saying you're you're right. You know, when you write a screenplay, you are you are trying to play tricks on your audience. It's like I'm thinking of a number, guess the number. And when the audience mm-hmm. guesses the correct number, you change the number. You say, oh, no, no, that yeah. wasn't it. Yeah, yeah. Because I don't, want you to get, I don't want you to be winning just yet. You know? And that's yeah, what yeah. it felt like when I watched Captain America. And I really don't enjoy that movie for that reason. I think it's a great movie otherwise. Really? But I can't allow yeah. myself to watch it be, or, or you know, to allow myself to get sucked into it because I just think you're trying, you're, you're, yeah, you're cheating at the game in order to try and get yeah. me to care about any of this. This is just one of those things where they just kind of very lazily yeah. kind of cross the line. I think. Um, I I would agree. I would agree entirely. Especially, I I know what you're talking about. I, it, you know that in that particular film, it doesn't it doesn't achieve it doesn't achieve what it wants to do. I think you know you can you can feel because, but mainly because the characters and the reactions of those characters tell you how to feel. Um, you you know you you know what it's going for. You know why it's there. You know what it's trying to achieve. But ultimately, you're absolutely right. It falls. It falls short for me. It's not something I'd ever thought of actually watching that. I love. I love that film. I'd never, never considered that before. But, but you know the, what the solution? Be you know what the solution is? The solution is simply, don't show him dying. Yeah. Don't show the character dying. Just you know, you can just say, I fail. Like I, I wasn't able to get him out alive. You know, mm-hmm. or or you know. I got out, he didn't, and by the time I yeah. go back in, you know, the, the medics have already got to him. And they can Stop. lie to him. But if you show me a character on, a, in, on the table in a morgue, they're dead. That's visual language yeah. 101, they're dead. You don't yeah. get to come back from that. You can come back to it with an Infinity Stone, but they didn't use Infinity <laughs> Stones then, you know. Anyway, that's my, big, yeah. that's my first big pet peeve. What's your next one? Oh, I like it. Um, my number four. My number four is it's it's. I, I think I have a. I think I have an exposition thing because mine's another exposition one, and it is exposition spoken out loud to thin air, and the person just happens to be standing just near enough that they can hear it. Convenient only for plot purposes, and that. And I'm sorry, John. That's Encanto, because there is that that it's that that moment. She's standing there. Mar- Maribel. Maribel. I think is um Maribel Madrigal. It's an amazing name. Um, is standing there, and her grandmother is just talking to the air to the candle, and she's saying, "Oh no, this terrible thing!" I've only seen it once. I can't remember the exact line. You have to forgive me. Perhaps, you, perhaps you know. Perhaps you know it off by heart. Perhaps you have the lines down. But <laughs> uh, in Italian, do you know that moment in Italian? <laughs> it's that moment. She's standing there, and she's saying, "Here is all of the information, protagonist, that you need in order to fulfill." And succeed in the quest that you are do- going on in this film, and oh god, just again, it, it's it's that it's that thing of it's it's similar in the sense to it's playing the game. You're depriving the audience of the opportunity to work it out for themselves, and and depriving, and also the, and the satisfaction of watching your protagonist go through the motions and go through the process of um, of figuring out what it is that needs to be done, and you know, and it, it's. It drives me up the wall that it, it happens a lot in um, in science fiction. So yeah, I you know I'm I love I love my Star Trek in Star Trek, and that you that's not the last time that'll be featured on this list. That name, um, but they are they um, it happens a lot where somebody you know the evil plan, 
the evil plan is is monologued on. You know, it's a slightly different variation on this, but it's still that exposition. You know, we were talking about Bond the other day. Um, ah, Mr. Bond, now there is no chance you shall get away and I'm going to tell you all of my evil plans. Oh, no, you escaped. It's terrible. And it's that it's that kind of thing that it's it's not fun. It's not fun. It's not. It, it for me, it takes me out of a film immediately, or a TV show, or whatever it is I'm watching. It takes me out of it immediately because I go, "Well, great, we just needed to know that for reasons that will become clear later on." I have no doubt. Um, thanks for spoon feeding me that information. And it, when the, you know, yeah, yeah, it is. It is really annoying when you are deprived of, and it is one of the most common notes when I, I that mm-hmm. I think I've given in my career as a. Yeah as a lecturer as well is, you know, and it's totally understandable when people learning their craft or, you know, are doing that. Yeah. They, you know, they, they're trying to work information into their stories. And that's totally, that's totally, that is what we do as storytellers. We're working information. In. But the trick is that you have to do it in a way where the audience can, uh, can have agency in the pro in the discovery process of information because mm-hmm. it is a visual medium yeah. and we want to be looking at things and looking for things on this big screen as well isn't it and yeah no it is, it is infuriating when when you when you're simply just spoon fed that information uh, you know mm-hmm. at every turn i do think lord of the rings is guilty of that quite a lot but then i i give them a yeah. fair pass because they you know, there's so much that they have to try and set up yeah. and you know realistically achieve in their even a three-hour movie but you know there's yeah, always sure. the moment where like as they approach a, a dangerous cave somebody's got some interesting backstory about that cave you know where you know yeah. and, and and it's and it's always that that thing where as we're about to approach some creature we we'll, we learn about the creature right before and yeah god forbid we should discover that creature in the moment um yeah oh no there it is yeah, yeah. It, it, they they do it in um the hobbit when they and it is it's slightly off this it's not it's not exposition being delivered aloud though it kind of is um they when they go to uh rivendell and Elrond is um, is uh, looking at this this map and these runes and everything, and he says, "Ah, it af- it appears fortune is on your side, Thorin Oakenshield. You can only have read this by the light of this moon, and by chance, it is this moon exactly the one time in ten years it could possibly go." And you know, it, and I I I th- you could, if you were working hard to justify it, then I suppose fate. I suppose you know, and it was meant to be, and you could probably do that. But if you, you know, like, like, it, like The Witcher, for example, has, has a concept called destiny. It is referred to as destiny, which is honorable mention for me. Just call it anything else because it annoys the hell out of me and takes me out of it. But that's, you know, that's an entirely separate thing. Um, you know, they, but they have this thing called destiny, which binds people together and allows things to happen. And, and it basically is fate, right? But you don't to my knowledge and perhaps i'm i'm showing a little bit of ignorance there there isn't that there isn't that force fate is something luck is something and it does occur in this in this fantasy world but not like that and no and i don't think is, so that no. is that is just chance you know it's it yeah. just so happens they arrived on that day it's too fortunate for my liking and, and it's so, unnecessary yeah. you know i remember yeah. we did watch the hobbit movies over christmas and i and i i really enjoy them i i don't think they deserve the kind of bad rap that they've gotten over the years. They're not as good as the originals, but then I don't think the story is actually as good as the original. So, you know, no, um, but the, the one, yeah, there is a lot of that, you know, Oh, it has to be read by this moonlight, by this scene, by this season or whatever it is. And it's like, why, why can't it just be moonlight? Yeah. Why does it have to be like, there's already a race to get to the mountain because everybody's trying to, you know, now is the time the, to wake up the dragon or whatever it is. But it's like, it, there doesn't need to be all of these contrivances as to how and why it has to be now. And it can't it just yeah. be, we're just on an adventure. Yeah, And exactly. there are other people who you want what we want and we just got to get there faster. Yeah. And it's as simple as that. You, you don't have to have it. And I remember just it's thinking. Already, there's a, it, yeah, sorry, go on. No, I was saying they, they get to the mountain like hours before the they it hits zero, yeah. you know? The timer hits yeah. zero. And it's and it's like if you had just been held up for one more even half a day, you would have missed this entire thing. Hundred percent, yeah. Like and, you could have left a year already, earlier. Like, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's already difficult difficult enough for them to read that thing as well, because it's yeah. already in a language they can't understand. 
and the only one person in Middle Earth understands, and he happens to be like a sworn blood enemy of the dwarves, and you know, and Gandalf has to trick them to get there. There's already enough. You don't need this sort of this. Um, ah, it can only be read by the same moon that is yeah. quite by chance. There, you know, it's it's silly. But I, I'm, I don't, I'm str- I don't know. I don't know if that's. I, I see. I don't know if that's in the original books, but it does feel like the. It it, it almost feels like Peter Jackson ch- trying to channel Tolkien. Rather mm. than just actually channel your inner screenwriter instead, you know, yeah, because actually exactly. that might make for a clearer movie. Anyway, um, yeah. I'm getting. Yeah, good. we're getting. We're touching on something else. I'm. I'm. I. Another one of my points. So, um, we'll, which <laughs> do I'm you want to seg- Do you want to segue into the next one? No, no, no. That's fine. I'll, that's my number one <laughs> pet peeve. So I, I, oh, okay. I'm excited to rant about. That. I'll, I'll wait. I'll wait. Over to All you. right. Big pet peeve <laughs> for me. Characters mm-hmm. not being credible in their stories. And I am seeing this ah. way more and more uh, as time goes on. Uh, we just wrapped up our review of Resident Evil last week. Uh, Welcome to Raccoon City. Not a single character mm-hmm. in that story is credible as a police officer or as any sort of character, any whatsoever in that, in that story. The big one for me, and this is because it's a film that people just um, are in love with, is James Cameron's Aliens. Uh, ah, I really? love Sigourney Weaver in that film. I love Alien, the Alien franchise. I've made, you know, I will, I'll be doing plenty of videos about all that stuff over the, or, as mm-hmm. time goes on. I cannot stand the Marines in Aliens, and I, it, yeah, I just, I just can't stand them. They are the most uh, unbelievable in all the worst ways. Mm-hmm. Marines. And I've seen articles where people have said, you know, like uh, military blogs and web, you know, organizations championing aliens as a great example of like the Marine, the Marine Corps and all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, surely that can't be a good, a good. (laughs) Yeah, I know they did a lot of training before the film got made. And I know, Mm -hmm. you know, James Cameron told them all to like, you know, customize their armor and all that and like make it behave like you are actually in the marines and sure. they had a i think one of the the a drill sergeant like a marine like a sergeant i think who kind of uh follows them along he's got the big cigar in his mouth he's like the big kind of tough 80s uh um, yeah, yeah. drill sergeant that kind guy. of character and yeah, he, he's in all of them i know <laughs> yeah yeah and he uh he ends up yeah he's like following them around and i think he trained them up as well in you know the actors but i'm like it doesn't matter how well you were trained the screenplay completely invalidates their abilities because yeah. you've described them as space marines you've described them as having encountered alien creatures on other planets and then they they go into this environment where there's like all these reactors around and this guy on the radio says oh, look you've got to con- you know sh- holster your weapons because you could blow the whole planet sky high here yeah, <laughs> and the the drill sergeant, the sergeant, whatever his name is, he's got to walk around and take the ammunition from them, like they're school children who've snuck, uh, yeah. who who've been playing on their mobile phones too much. You know, he has to confiscate their ammunition because they're so untrustworthy. Because they're these just yeah. these kind of they're like these eighties quintessential kind of um, jocks. You know, they're, it's just bro culture. It's just it, you know. <laughs> God forbid if you're like a woman in the group because you're going to get all sorts of flack, you know? It's they yeah. they're the most unprofessional group. Hicks is the only guy who's who's who you can trust. And and they're absolutely he's absolutely right to have to confiscate the ammunition because guess what? One of them has pocketed some ammunition and then distributed it to everybody. You've just been told oh, yeah. these are nuclear reactors that could blow up the planet. Yeah. And you're and going he, to you're going to crack on do this anyway. You know, why don't you light up as well while you're at it, you know, and just yeah. blow us all to bits. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's just and this happens in so many movies where you see the characters that just absolutely not credible in their roles as anything. I've seen countless lawyers who are just not believable as lawyers. I've mm-hmm. seen uh, soldiers, time to get. We've all seen, you know, the famous action movies where they just don't even know how to hold a gun properly or whatever. That's yeah, fine. Sure, like, sure. but it's when you, it's when these films are like really cherished 
and really mm-hmm. beloved films and nobody at all questions the absurdity of these characters and how they even got their jobs. I don't believe those characters in Aliens would have passed boot camp, let alone <laughs> get into the Space Marine Corps. I mean, think about the level of skill yeah. you would want, you would need to be in the Space Marines. Space Marines, yeah. It's <laughs> Not even just Marines. I mean, you've got to be good enough to be an astronaut and then a Marine. Yeah, <laughs> like sure. it, It's just... <laughs> I hate it. It drives me yeah. mad. Anyway, you're up. it's that it's that same thing as the kind of the the quirky uh, the quirky scientist, isn't it? You know the uh, the guy who's he's uh, he. I don't I don't play by the same rules as you do, and yet I'm still a really great scientist. You know, I think um, to a lesser extent, you know, Jeff Goldblum's character in Independence Day is a little bit like that. I, you know, actually, Jeff Goldblum in uh, Jurassic Park. To touch on that again, is is kind of a similar kind of vibe, but maybe it's just Jeff Goldblum. Maybe that's a thing, but. The you know it is it is that that kind that I I totally yeah I'm totally with you on that it, it it's not difficult to it's not difficult to show you know that somebody it's it's it, right it's it's almost I suppose it's almost to save the cat kind of vibe isn't it you know just show show them do, doing it well show them doing it well and mm. allow the audience to understand that they're good at their jobs and then if they make a mistake later it's it's okay because we know they were good. We know that they're okay to do it. It's not enough by name alone to say, um, you know, this is, they are good. You've got to, you've got to demonstrate. It's a show, not talent. Then. It's almost like the reason Ellen Ripley is such a great character is because she's surrounded by such incompetent characters. <laughs> now, she is a great character in the way she's written and everything, but it's, there is a part of where you think it's, hard, it's very hard for her not to be a great character when she's just surrounded. Yeah. Anyway, so anyway. So what's your next one? Yeah. Mine is a trope. Mine is a trope. The next one, number three for me, is the love conquers all trope. I hate it, John. I hate it so much. Speaking of, uh, it's something you know. Conveniently, didn't come up in our Matrix Resurrections. (laughs) It didn't come up in our Matrix Resurrections conversation we had the other day. But this whole this whole thing of um, uh, and spoilers for Matrix Resurrections if you haven't seen it. But the whole thing of um, uh, Neo and, and Trinity, they they are part of the one. They are both part of the one. And look, they're going to they're going to touch in the middle of this big fight sequence. And oh, white light and everything explodes. And oh, because they are together. Ah, oh, it's so great. And you look at you look at Matrix Resur- uh, Resurrections against um, the third of the three, the original trilogy. You see that trope done well, and you see it done badly. And in the the third of the three. You have love conquering all because Neo couldn't have got there without Trinity. It's a physical thing. It's a, it's a, um, it's a. I am going to help you because I love you, but also because it's the right thing to do, and I'm not going to let you go do this on your own. Against um, the fourth, which is like it's just kind of mythical, powery stuff like that. And 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 you you know you know how much I love. Um, uh, Doctor Who and things like that, but for me, that that is the greatest sin of that program is that love always saves the day. There is, I'm not kidding you, one of the worst things I've ever seen in that program, and it pains me to say it because I love it so deeply. James Corden did an episode of Doctor Who where, there, and it was, um, you know, he and I know you're not familiar with it, but um, the 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 cy the Cybermen are there, right? And the, these big, you know, hulking great Cybermen is this terrifying beast. And James Corden's character is, and I probably should have seen it coming because there's no way he's, you know, turning out a dramatic performance in Doctor Who, but it's still it still gets me he he's there and he's strapped into this cyber armor and he's and he's like oh oh no i'm i'm about to be overtaken and and it's getting into his brain and he's starting to speak like a cyberman and you're genuinely there like oh god like this this character is this character is going to be consumed by this and turned into this terrible thing and then the and then his baby starts crying and he goes and 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 the readings start fluctuating and the doctor's there like oh i realize what's happening here Listen, listen, James Corden. Listen to the sound of your child, and then he does this thing, and you know the the cyber helmet shut back across his face, and he starts beating out. He's breaking it, and the and the baby's crying louder, and he bursts forward, and he gets out of it. He goes, "I'm coming, Alfie." Oh, sod off! It's just it's lazy. It's lazy, and it's annoying. And I'm and you cannot 
it's 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 just, it's irritating in every single every single way because just just do anything else and 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 it get perhaps perhaps it's because i'm i'm such a big um doctor who fan that i've been beaten down by this particular trope because it is in almost all of the episodes it's in almost everything um you know and they sometimes they'll do something interesting and they'll flip it a little bit but not very often and just do something else have something else have actual work save the day have some kind of clever thought process that you've divined through this wonderful adventure that you've just been on save the day. Don't have you falling in love with a random bloke or your child or anything like that save the day because it's lazy. It's lazy. It's, not, it's, not, it's like they're using they're using it as a magic power, and it's yeah. but they're not they're not. They, it's almost like they get to hide behind. Oh no, it's still reality. This isn't fiction. This isn't fantasy because, yeah, um, or it is fiction. But it's like, this isn't science fiction or fantasy because it's just uh, it's it's uh, it's love. That's a real thing, right? Yeah. Everybody loves somebody. And you know right? what you love know, is. You know what love yeah. is, audience. You know yeah. you you there you there sat on your sofa. You've you've got a child, and I bet it'd be great for you to feel as though if you were being attacked by a cyberman, you could burst forth and save the day with that it's um you know what's funny a, yeah. in inspector there's um there's a moment where bond is being kind of tortured mm-hmm. and madeline swan is standing <sighs> over him and kind of ba- kind of like she doesn't know what to do and i genuinely believed i remember watching it thinking oh she's going to kind of break him out of this kind of trance or whatever that he's being put under because not trance that makes it sound like it was written in the 50s but it's like it, you know it's <laughs> he's like his brain is being mean, yeah. drilled or whatever i don't know and it's just i did think oh she's going to be the magic power the magic elixir that's mm-hmm. gonna you know strengthen him enough to break out of it or resist or whatever and yeah to be honest i i may need to revisit that movie because i'm not entirely sure if Maybe that is actually how it ends, how 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 it happens. I don't know. I think, it feels. I, I think know. it is because I I have a feeling it is. Again, I haven't seen it for a long time, but I I think the because the drill is they they're drilling into his brain to sort of to you know so Blofeld can get rid of who he is and something like that, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And then I think she is the thing that anchors him to who he is. I think yeah, something like, yeah, if not yeah. physically, like I would wager um, that in a previous yeah. draft it was love conquered yeah. all in that moment. I bet yeah. you any money. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, good shout. Yeah, that's a good one. All right. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, big one for me is trying to build drama out of stuff we already know about. And again, ah, I see okay. it way too much. It's waiting, leaving the audience just waiting for the characters to catch up. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the idea of uh, in in one of the recent Star Wars films. There's a moment where you think a major character has died, and it's like, oh my god! And in the very next scene, you know the character is still alive. But our protagonist, our heroes don't know that. And it's about, I want to say maybe 20 minutes before they figure it out. And I just spent the whole 20 minutes going, when are they going to figure this out? Because there's no drama in it now. They're all mourning and grieving and everything. And it's like, when are they going to figure it out? It's the, um, and I mentioned Raiders before. Raiders does this really well, where you think Indy thinks Marion is dead. We're supposed to think she's dead, but only for a moment because Spielberg knows we're smarter than that. And so what does he do? He reveals to us that she's still alive uh, a few scenes later. And then it isn't long before Indy realizes, you know, they don't, they, don't, uh, they don't leave us waiting for Indy just to catch up to our knowledge uh, for very long. And they're doing this in the new Boba Fett show. Go watch our discussions about that. There's several scenes where several episodes, in fact, built around, you know, not a, we're not getting huge amounts of new information in those episodes because there's so much knowledge we already have. And we're just waiting to kind of waiting for those stories to catch up to our knowledge. And, and I do think that's a big reason why it hasn't resonated with audiences. I know a lot of people have been very kind of uh, bored by the show. And, and, it's, and we won't get into specifics of that because you can just watch our discussion of it. But it is, 
it is a it is a big kind of pet peeve of mine is the idea of don't have us waiting for for a character you know there's no drama in us knowing that thing isn't where you think it is or you think he's the person who killed everybody or whatever but we know it's not so there's no drama in your invest in your investigation uh so yeah it's just the, yeah. i don't know what else to it, go into that but it's kind of, well it's kind of, it's kind of dramatic irony done bad isn't it you know it's the you know you can have so you can have the audience know something that the the characters don't and and you know and that can quite often be very effective and you know especially for comedic purposes or you know whatever it might be um or for or for or for drama and for tragedy you know if you, you know the um the the class um shakespeare romeo and juliet you know the it is that thing the audience knows that um I think anyway, it's been a long time since I read it, but I, the audience knows at the very end, spoilers for Romeo and Juliet, if you don't know the ending, um, the, um, the audience know that they are, that uh, Romeo is alive. They know that Romeo is, um, is alive. And then Juliet kills herself. And it's that mo- it's so much worse. It's so much more awful because, um, because the audience knows that. And then, and then Romeo wakes up because we know he was going to wake up. And so we're braced for it and we're tensing and we're like, oh God, this is going to be so horrendous. And so that makes it worse. And, you know, so it can, it can be so great. It can but be the, so the great. Re- that works because you're not, you're not waiting long. Yeah. You know, you're in oh, the yeah. moment and you're having fun with the knowledge that you, know, that you have, the, this privileged position that you're in as the audience. So that, mm. Like there is value in that. But it's mm. when you wait a whole act for yeah. the character to wake up, so to speak. That's when it gets, and it happens so much. I've seen half a season of television of yeah. Star Wars now built around waiting for the character to catch up to my level of knowledge. Yeah. Um, I've, wa- I've watched entire first acts of three hour movies waiting mm. for characters. You know, or or showing us the killer at the beginning, which never made yeah. sense to me in any in any who done it. No, and then and then we're just we're just sitting there wondering, like, yeah, how is how is this person going to solve the case? But mm. our whole it's just me tapping my watch, saying, "Hurry up, yeah, and get to yeah, it." You know, I, we should look at um at some stage, look at the, the book of Boba Fett against something like The Witcher, the first series of The Witcher, and the the two kind of. Uh, non-linear storytelling ideas and how how they you know a little comparison because that because it is interesting that you know looking speaking in terms of waiting for audience to catch up to to our level of knowledge you know the the witch to my mind anyway i i loved that that twist in the witcher that that you know you have these multiple um uh kind of timelines going on i think that's really cool i think they did it really well whereas i i agree in kind of the book of boba fett doesn't it's, it is different. It's not the same, but it, you know the similarity in terms of different timelines and things like that. Um, yeah, I agree. I, yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. But, but totally agree with that. We should look into it more. Uh, okay, what's your next one? My next one, um, a little bit more broad. This one, and uh, possibly a little bit more divisive. Um, voiceovers, just voiceovers. It's just annoying. It's stupid. It's just I. I, I I um I can't ah oh, I don't know what I'm uh, no I'm going to share it I've started so I'm going to share it I can't watch um The Handmaid's Tale because of voiceovers I can't do it yeah I can't do it there was a there was in I think first or second episode I watched a few of them first or second episode um she has something something's happened I, it was years ago i watched it i can't really recall now but um it's years ago um some, something's happened to her and she's very angry she's very angry and she and she looks at the looks at him and says, oh, i'm so angry and she turns around and the voiceover kicks in and goes i was angry with him and i went no no i'm i'm done i'm out that, that's this no there's no need it doesn't add anything you you and you deliver so much better through just the 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 physicality of the thing, like like we've said already this time around, it's a visual medium, right? So w- what are we doing with all this that, and the other? And my the, but the greatest culprit and the thing that put me onto this in the first place because it ruined my life for about a month um, was Dexter, and Dexter the voiceovers in Dexter. We we watched the first two and a half series and we stopped because um, 
we, my, my wife and I, couldn't get his voice out of our head. This this sort of low, methodical narration and everything we were doing, we were just narrating to ourselves in our heads. And so, it, and I, so, I it ruined it, which is not not my actual issue with it, but it was annoying. But it's not my real problem. Um, the problem is, is that with that, with that in particular, and and you know the the second series arc of that with um, which I think th- always think should have been the the final series arc um, of of Dexter having to investigate him. Spoilers, Dexter having to investigate himself. Um, you know is why do we need his internal monologue? And I understand it, it, it serves uh, thematic and tonal and, you know, purposes like that. I get it. I get what it represents. I know that he, um, that, you know, his upbringing has, has kind of led him to be very self-critical and things like that. I understand all of that. I just think it doesn't work. Fundamentally, as a, as a viewer, it takes me out of it immediately because this, this kind of, it, because it, it breaks the fourth wall, I guess, in a, in a sense. And, and you know, unless I, I, so actually, what I'll clarify, I'll clarify the point here. Use the way voiceover can be used, because if you have somebody, for example, who is, um, you know, you bookend a film, uh, Lord of the Rings, take that one again, you know, or actually the the Hobbit series, um, take that again. So you have uh, it starts with this uh, voiceover from Bilbo who is writing at his at his thing, and it ends with that same thing and you're bookending it and it and so it makes it all part of this one narrative and sits nicely i got no issue with that um if you you know there are occasions uh, galadriel in lord of the rings as well you know she's they use voice over there when she's not speaking to show that she's communicating telepathically fine all good it's when you hear the in- the internal monologue of a character um why just why just why yeah it is it is i think it's a real i mean it's interesting that you, you've if with Handmaid's Tale, I I I enjoyed some of the voiceover. I thought it was really interesting to see the very subservient kind of facade that she puts on. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we hear how she really feels about these people underneath, you know. And and I thought mm-hmm. that was interesting because in a story where people are silenced, um it's nice to be able to hear what what they really feel in those moments because they can't oh. they can't react the way that they normally would um mm-hmm. and and imagine it must be I, I i don't know if you would get away i know the i know the line you've just you've just cited i'm angry yeah showing us what we already know that kind of telling us what we already know yeah but um i don't know how what the handmaid's tale would be like without voiceover I don't know mm-hmm. what the performances would be, cons- how they'd be interpreted, and things like that. Um, yeah. I do, I do but agree I think- with you, though. I don't think I've ever seen. I mean, I don't, I don't want to say def- make definites here, but I, I am struggling to find an example of where voiceover has to exist. It might work really well, but whether mm-hmm. it works well or not, is it needed? Yeah, does it, it's is it absolutely yeah. necessary? I mean, I love the voiceover in Goodfellas. You yeah. know, Paulie didn't move fast so because Paulie didn't have to move for anybody. I mean, how uh, how else do you get that sure. line across? You know, it's yeah. one of my yeah, favorite yeah. lines. But I, yeah, I think you could do Goodfellas without voiceover because mm-hmm. I don't think it matters. Yeah, what, I think I think that you know. I think that yeah, and and you know what you point you point to a, a good example of it done well, and and that's the thing is you know it, it is it is it it, but it, can, but it he, can work well and it can elevate, but it it but I think elevate is the is the thing. Yeah, I think when it's used and it and it's very rarely it's very rarely used that well. Um, it's very rarely a tool that's really that, that pushes that story forward. And but and even but you, even in Goodfellas, I don't know if you need it. To tell the story, mm. I love that it's there, and I think everybody loves yeah. that it's there. Ray Liotta's, you know, voice and everything is just amazing in that. Mm-hmm. I just don't know if it's actually essential. Like that's the thing: yeah. is it essential in Handmaid's Tale? I don't know. I think it works, but I don't know if it's essential. Yeah, I think I think it's definitely stemmed from lazy approaches to screenwriting in the past. Mm-hmm. And it's become this thing now where it's the low hanging fruit for screenwriters to in order for them to get what they need. Um, Absolutely, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. So no, go, no, go, go on. Go. I've had my rant. You, <laughs> mine is <laughs> all I've written here is 
making a mess of Chekhov's gun. <laughs> <laughs> And 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 it's <laughs> it's been, it's been, and I've written <laughs> and spoilers for Succession. Uh, remind me to put a spoiler warning at the head of the uh, the episode. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, I've written Succession and the Drowning. Okay. Have you seen okay. Succession? I haven't seen Succession. No. It's okay. On my list. I may it's on I may, end, I may end up spoiling behind. something a small bit here for you. Um, That's all right. I'll try and I'll try and tiptoe around it. All right, so Chekhov's gun. If you're going to have a, a gun in, in the first act or whatever of the story, you better pay it off later on. If you're going to have information embedded, you know, a key and important information, it needs to be embedded later on. Uh, I think my father has a gun in his, in his desk drawer, and then people break into the house. Guess what? We're going to go for the gun oh, in look, the drawer. The gun. Yeah. Yep. Um, in succession, they have... Uh, there's a great kind of a moment where somebody does something really bad. I'm going to try and tiptoe around this. Um, Feel free. You, you, you go, go for it. It's, it's, it, it's okay. Kendall uh, is involved, is complicit in the death of a young boy, a young man, uh, like a teenager or something, right? And he was, I think, on drugs at the time or something, right? And... And it's a big thing that determines his entire behavior for like season two. Mm-hmm. And then later on, like for a bit of season three as well. And it, like, it really weighs on him. And the whole big active question around Kendall for an entire season is, when are the others going to find out about this? Okay. And eventually, uh, season three, he confesses to his siblings. And his siblings uh, are like, oh, don't beat yourself up over it. You know, don't, it's okay. You know, like, I mean, no, come on, it could have happened to anybody, you know? And, and did you, uh, like, did you try and, did you try and save the guy? Yeah, yeah, I tried. I swear to God, I tried. Oh, well then, what are you giving out? What are you beating yourself up over? You tried. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Oh. This was built oh. up as you did something bad. And, and it was not presented as you tried your best, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, and you I, didn't, you did. And, you, and, 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 you know, daddy's money hid the whole thing and so on and so forth. You know? Right. This is not at all something that you get to just sweep under the rug <laughs> or gaslight away or whatever, however you want to phrase it. And it yeah. is the most wasted example of Chekhov's gun I've ever seen ever. Like in anything. Oh, and I true, love yeah. succession to bits, right? But yeah. this is a moment where uh, you have, you had the chance for people to just go, oh my God, what the hell is wrong? You know, or like you need to get your life together or whatever. No, it's just everybody coming together to make him feel better. And they use certain, they kind of, they, it's almost like they repaint the picture of what happened in season one. Mm-hmm. Where it's like, in season one, it's presented as he got scared and ran away. And in season three, it's presented as, no, I tried my best to save him, but I couldn't. It was too dark and like, like the odds were against me. Right. I said, no, 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 don't. Right. You, had, you set up this amazing thing, which is so one not, of the so reasons not why... He's, people, he's not know. that he's lying to his siblings to try and like get no, away no, no, with it and to no. make them... It's not that at all. He's, he's, he's no. being sincere. He's completely forthright and forthcoming in all the information. And his siblings, in, in their attempt to make him feel better, I mean, they don't know any, they don't know the facts, but they're trying to make him feel better. And in doing so, they're convincing the audience that this isn't a big deal. Oh, that's so like, weird. Yeah. It's so annoying. That's so it's weird. It's so annoying. And, and I, again, it's one of those things that happens a lot where there are just these mm-hmm. golden opportunities to pay off this thing with amazing drama or amazing, an amazing argument or an amazing showdown between characters. And it's like, it just doesn't come. It doesn't happen. And, yeah. And you think this was just a waste of the gun in the drawer scene. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, thieves break into the house and you use dad's. Hunting, hunting trophy to, to, to beat <laughs> yeah, them yeah, instead, yeah. you know? And it's like, well, yeah. wouldn't it have been more interesting if you had tried to pick up the rifle, you know? Uh, I don't yeah. know. Uh, there's, so, a great, yeah. um, there's, a, there's a great moment in, uh, I know you like Family Guy. You watch American Dad? Mm. Yeah, there's a great, there's so. a great bit in American, very, really great bit in American Dad where they, they are, they're playing with Chekhov's gun 
Yeah, not, yeah. They're not actually playing with kickoffs. That would be great, but they um, <laughs> they play with it. And the uh, and Stan, can you, can you imagine? He goes, oh, look, uh, it belongs to Chekhov, isn't it? Um, he, he Stan uh, Stan's looking at it. It's the episode where the um, the house yeah, yeah, uh, gets yeah, I know flooded the one. and flips upside down. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, and yeah, he yeah. looks And he looks down the thing, and he goes, oh, I'm looking for something. What are you looking for? My old college javelin. And then, of course, it comes to play. It's my fa- it's my favorite thing. It's my favorite thing yeah. ever. That, Love that episode. Um, yeah, that moment. It's so great. It's so great because that whole thing, that whole thing is just set up, pay off, set up, pay off. That whole way through, and there's a few, there's a few other bits, but that the old college javelin and then, comes and then back he's, again. He's and using again. the javelin to fend off a bear, which is incredible. Yeah. And <laughs> and he it. ends up hitting Francine, his wife, instead. And yeah. she's like, "No, no, no, don't do it." And he's like, "No, no, it's okay. I got this." And then he throws it and he hits her. And it's like, you harpooned me. <laughs> you know, I asked you not to stop and yeah. you harpooned me instead. You or sorry, I asked you to stop and you harpooned me instead. And it's just, yeah, yeah. it's so fantastic. It's so funny. It's uh, so but that's, a, it's, that's an example of actually, that is a better execution of Chekhov's gun. It is. Than, than, than half the stuff I see sometimes, which is just yeah. so I mean, underwhelming. So because the- you're setting it up and you, the audience is just saying, okay, when's this thing they keep remembering this thing and every time there's a, a character's in a predicament the audience immediately going to say how are they going to get out of this oh they'll use that thing from before yeah, yeah, and, yeah. It, and and you can subvert it for sure and you can have fun with it for sure but to just Absolutely. simply write it off as if it's no longer convenient for us to use that plot point which is very yes. much what this felt like in succession in succession this felt like you know what? We don't really know where to go with this anymore. We don't really have the energy to explore that thing anymore, the or the bandwidth or whatever to explore it. So, you know what? We're just gonna we're just write it out. It's fine. Every everyone's forgiven him. It's fine. You know, and that's <laughs> that's, that's okay. what it feels like. You know, so you know, Chekhov's gun works. Chekhov's gun implies that you have structure and that you have a plan. And I think yeah. when I think about all the examples of Chekhov's gun done poorly, it's always television for me. Yeah, or yeah. it's always a series of films that didn't really have a coherent vision, and and it it, 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 is, in, um, it is a thing where it only works if you have a clear vision for how to use yeah. this stuff later on. You know, so anyway, there's a there's a great example in the Harry Potter films because um, you know when they when they started making them, the books weren't all out yet, so they didn't know what they had to foreshadow and know what they needed to put in there. And um, there's a very very important. Uh, Sure, you say MacGuffin, but it's a prop. We'll say in the um, in in a, a piece of mirror that was given to Harry by Sirius and blah 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 blah. And it's so important in that last book. It's so important in that last film because it's the only way they get saved. And but they didn't know to include it at any point. And so in that last film, suddenly Harry just has this bit of mirror. He just has it, and it's just there. And he didn't know it was there. Um, and we, we'd never seen it before. They they showed it earlier in the film, but it was it's a shoehorned moment where they just go, "Oh crap, we need to use this thing," and you know it's flickering, and and that that's one of those things where to make the point about it not being planned, they didn't know they didn't know they were going to need that. It's not really the filmmaker's fault. It's just it's one of those things they started making those films before the books were done. Yeah, you know, it's a weird decision in my opinion, but okay, you wanted to do it, and um, that. That's a, it's an example there of to make the point of it's not planned. It's not planned ahead. You haven't planned ahead. You missed something, and then you've had to shoehorn in a, a detail that you know perhaps should have been there from from earlier. Yeah. What's your number one, Marcus? Oh, John, number one. This and this is my number one pet peeve. You know, we can do as many videos as we want <laughs> on this subject. I am never going to be as angry with anything as I am about this, and it is anger as well. It is white hot rage that I feel towards this. Um, and it is pretty niche to the science fiction uh, fantasy genre. Oh, are you ready? I'm excited. I'm excited to share this with you. I'm excited to share this with you. Characters saying things are impossible and then just doing it. What is going on? It happens all the time you get, you know, I, I'll, I'll point to Star Trek, which I'm having to, I'm in my brain thinking over why I like this show so much because I've referenced it so many times in this um <laughs> this video about issues. Um the you, you, you know it's it's the classic oh Captain I'm giving her all she's got. Well you'll have to give her more Mr. Scott. He goes, oh okay. 
I find it, I think it's a Family Guy takeoff. You know, he goes, oh, Captain, I'm so sorry to call you back again. I, I've just found this lever, and it turns out I was not giving her all she's got the whole time. And, you, you know, it's it's so aggravating. They do it in everything. And, the um, and, you know, it, it, there are occasions where it works fine. And and, I, and I've, I've preempted myself here. I've tried to be objective about this particular issue. Um because you know it can work if if like the the sequence on Dagobah in Empire, um, Luke stands there and very famously, "Oh, what you ask is Im- impossible," um, and then Yoda does it, and but it makes a point, it makes a narrative point, and you know then you get the do or do not, there is no try, and you know all this that and the other, and it's and it's and it's great, and 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 it works for that reason, but when. But you know, you you get it. You get in these things, and it's where the screenwriter is, or or the or the, um, the director, or whoever it is that's inserting this nonsense into things, is um, is trying to up the stakes, and they're trying to make it. It's trying to make it so it's 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 more difficult, you know. And and that, and that's what I meant earlier on when I said we were touching on things there with Elrond. Um, because the because the writer is there is saying ah but we need to make it more difficult so it's it's impossible oh but it's not impossible just by sheer chance it's like <laughs> no if it's impossible it's impossible because now we're at this situation where in and and when I one day uh, show run my epic fantasy show that I have in mind then there will be a rule in the in the writers room that you cannot use the word impossible unless it is actually impossible. Um, because net, you get you get to this point where I don't believe them now. You could have something that is legitimately yeah. impossible, yeah. and and I just don't believe it. You know, and I and I'm and I'm sat there waiting for them to figure out a way around it. I'm sat there waiting for them to work mm. out a way around it. Now, the Star Trek example again. You know, actually a series built around trying. To be honest with you, that you know they um they they use the they they come up across uh, against a situation that they perceive to be impossible and then they work it out using science and and reason and empirical blah 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 and i and i get it and i and i understand it but just find a different word because it's not impo- it's clearly not impossible and and you know you get you get something is appearing out of nowhere that's impossible well it's not though is it because you're looking at it it's clearly well, not impossible well, when I was uh, when I was doing my master's degree, we had a, a an exercise once where it was we went through our dialogue and we li- we had to actually like get. It wasn't like we had to actually literally look up the dictionary definitions for the words, but it was a case where we had to kind of really think about: is this really mm. the word you want to use? Because yeah. I think we are far too. Um, carefree when we when we when we're writing dialogue as writers we don't think about what the words actually mean anymore for sure and you know everything is literal and all that kind of you know and and yeah it does it does lead to a kind of a, i suppose a weakening of concepts in in your universe yeah. because uh, you should you, you should know. be able to go you should you know you should be able to look at something and and say you know that that is impossible that or, or you know i can't do i can't do this we can't save this character's life because it's impossible it's not possible to do it and you get it in you know in the in the in the great dramas i mean i could i could probably bundle all these up to be fair it's impossible that they um it's impossible that it will happen and then the voiceover cuts in that the character's sad about it and then love saves the day as somebody is talking around the corner about this thing and then a man a man explains to the woman how it happened you know i can bundle up all of my my stuff in that one in my one thing but um the but the point the point really is that and and you you made it far more eloquently than I have is is to be careful with what you're writing and be careful what you're using because you end up in this situation where I the moment somebody says something's impossible, um, I I tune out because I know it's not going to be yeah it's not and, it's and, not and, actually necessary yeah yeah it's it's false stakes and and you know and it's one of those things where it's almost a case now where it's a it's a it's an earmark or it's a, it's a it's it's telling the audience that this this big obstacle is not impossible. It's almost as if the moment you say it's impossible is the moment you realize it's not. Yeah, for, it's, for the, it's for the thing. It's giving you know? away the giving away the solution, or not not the solution, but it's giving away the, I suppose, the outcome. Uh, we might not know how they're going to overcome that impossible odd, but we know they're going to overcome it. Um, now, yeah. I, I'll go. I'll go back on myself there a little bit, and I will. I will say, and again, to in in defense of Star Trek, because I've given it a hard time. Um, there is a there's a great episode of uh, of deep of uh, Deep Space Nine where they where they 
um, subvert that. And it, and I think it's and it's smart the way they do it because they because the subversion wouldn't work if it wasn't a problem in the first place. They do carry on doing it afterwards, but whatever. Um, you know, they you have you have this um, this this episode where the the doctor's on a planet. He's trying to cure this this disease, and he's trying everything, and he's trying everything, and he and it, in the end, he has to come to this realization: it is impossible. He can't cure it. He cannot achieve this thing, and that character then has to. Uh, has to live with the fact that actually he can't do everything, and there are restrictions, and and you know, and and it and it, and it gives us growth in the character and and things like that, and it works really well because we are accustomed in in genres such as that to things not everything being um you know nobody dies forever no you know people always come back from the dead and and everything nothing is impossible and all this that and the other um. And so it's really nice in when you see something like that happen, and they do, and they do tweak it, and they subvert it, and they say, actually, no, there are some things that are. I just wish they didn't. I just wish they were. It's nice that they do that. I just wish they weren't in the situation where they had to in the first place. Just use a different word other than impossible. Is basically mm. my point. Yeah, and and <laughs> you you did touch on the idea that actually we can actually get far more interesting things from impossible meaning impossible characters yeah. can actually learn yeah. a lesson. It is something I think that is probably most common. Uh, the thing that we share with those characters is the idea of failing. Everybody yeah. fails at Fallibility. something. Yeah, and the yeah. idea of being able to acknowledge that you know what this isn't a this isn't a good uh this isn't going to work or this isn't you know this isn't a good direction to go down can actually just be a really mature moment for you as a person to re- to make that realization. Absolutely, and, cutting your losses and and you know going yeah. right okay well maybe I need to try something else this time you know because it's it's. One of the reasons why you get so many, let's say, villainous characters in stories is because sometimes it's they succeed too much and they become arrogant. They become, mm-hmm. you know, uh, dangerous to themselves and to others because they think they can fail. Yeah. And yeah, so it's funny actually because they're kind of shooting themselves in the foot as screenwriters by using that word and then and then and not and not following through on it, you know. Absolutely, absolutely, mm. and it, and you know it, it's also the it can be the, the a great starting point for you look at you know most Marvel films you look at the uh, Tony Stark's origin he he starts off when he realizes he can't achieve something and he has to um, you know when he realizes that this is being used for good and he's not and he's knocked down a peg you know he's he's brought down a peg and yes he does go and you know build this thing in a, a cave and everything so perhaps not the best example but the point being that he he is forced to confront his own fallibility and he's forced to confront the fact that he um that he doesn't know it all and and then grow from there as a character so it can be just as it's useful for villains it's useful for um yeah yeah that's i've made my point and i'll 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 climb down off my soapbox now and you can all go back to watching science fiction quite happily what is your final one (laughs) my final one is it's just kind of a head scratcher really it's just glaring plot holes that made it through countless 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 uh departments and re script readers and executives and all that kind of stuff and yet the plot hole still exists um we did our discussion of james bond last week or two weeks ago, whenever it was. And we talked about Skyfall and there's that, you know, I talked about how the whole plot of that movie makes zero sense because of one line of dialogue. Um, But even with that line of dialogue removed, it still doesn't explain how the villain knows that there's going to be a train passing overhead and to blow up the the thing at the right time because Bond will be there when, you know, there's just no way he could know that kind of stuff. And it also yeah. is just far too contrived. And what would have been far better is just have a, a booby trap in the doorway. Mm. I mean, that's it. For you know, sure. he's gone. You, you know, to, instead you of know. Like blowing up yeah. the railway track, you know. And it's, yeah. I don't understand how that made it past everybody. The people who had to build this stuff, the people who had to, like, story, like, it just, it's, there's an insane amount of people that would have had to, surely no one pointed that out. And you know what? I do think. There is a lack, you know, I think sometimes I'm being very nitpicky when I start pulling together, pulling apart plot holes and stuff. But I also think it's, it's made me a better writer being that critical because there is a story in Skyfall about, uh, so Daniel Craig, when he was in, um, I can't remember, it was one of the set pieces, uh, I think it's in Asia somewhere. And he, 
But he, Daniel Craig himself went shopping and he bought this beautiful pair of leather gloves and he wanted to use it in the in 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 the shoot in the film. So they filmed him. Uh, there's the scene with the uh, with the Komodo dragon down in the pit, and Bond falls into the pit, and one of the the goons falls into the pit as well. And the Komodo dragon is kind of slowly biding his time to to kind of grab the uh, grab one of them, whoever you know is the survivor. And Bond has a gun that can only be read by his palm print, by his fingerprints. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the bad guy picks it up and tries to use it on Bond, and he can't because it doesn't work. But Bond picks it up as well, and Bond is using it. But he shouldn't be able to because actually he's wearing gloves. And they had to CGI out the yeah. gloves. And I think Bond had to, uh, Daniel oh. Craig had to pay for it, I think. And so oh, they, had to, they had to CGI out the gloves in order to make that scene work. Otherwise, the plot hole wouldn't work. Now, again, like, how are you filming that scene? And nobody on set is saying, wait a minute. I thought he's not supposed to be, I thought it's supposed to be his palm print that allows him to use the gun, right? And the big example for me is in Rise of Skywalker, they found a dagger and this dagger is supposed to be like a map to where this old artifact is. And it turns out the artifact is on the ruins of the Death Star. And I guess I am going to spoil it. And the, the, the knight, the dagger is almost like a map in the sense that like, if you hold it up, the shape of the dagger matches the shape of the Death Star. But you would have to know exactly where to stand. And if you're even, a, if you, if you're even an inch out of step, you might as well be a thousand miles away because it's not going to yeah. make any sense to you. Um, yeah. And it has the, to be that exact moon that's shining down so you can read the words. <laughs> <Yeah. and> it's, <laughs> it's all the same stuff as the Hobbit. But, it's, but yeah. none of that makes sense because... That means some person carved out a dagger, a, 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 a weapon that would blunt over time, mm-hmm. uh, to and carved it out. Use <laughs> and the shape standing there in this the skyline of the Death Star ruins, yeah, which are being destroyed yeah. by waves, like yeah. by by tsunami level waves. So not, like, not to mention that they quite clearly show the Death Star atomized at the end of Return of the I Jedi. I know, we won't even not get even... into that, yeah. But it's like, it, but like this, the, the idea of this could collapse at any point, the, 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 sh- the ch- erosion is going to take hold. Um, you have to be standing, like, and they just happen to be standing there. And, I, and I, it completely went over my head watching the film because I actually enjoyed my time with that film when I saw it in the cinema. But afterwards, when I was defending the film to people who were like saying, God, I hated it, they were pointing this out to me. And I was thinking, yeah, how did that, how did that ever get through the script? Because it's just so convoluted that somebody carved, an, a, 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 carved a, a, a shape of a dagger based on the ruins of the Death Star. Just, th- like, just even saying that out loud is just so silly. And when I think, to me, the problem is I, I I can I can buy certain plot holes. I can just I can just forget about certain plot holes and just go with the flow. But what I what drives what what disrupts my enjoyment of the film is when I start thinking about how the filmmakers didn't seem to catch how none of them seemed to catch this stuff or question this stuff. And if they did, the fact that they let it through, you know, obviously you didn't care enough. And it's I start to lose respect for the film. Now I love Skyfall as a film, but that's Two examples of plot holes. One of them they had to fix at considerable expense because no one was paying attention. And the other one, maybe people were paying attention, but no one felt the need to rewrite the script in order to work out the train schedule, you know? And so it's it's this kind of... I'm all for giving people the benefit of the doubt. I'm all for giving for acknowledging that films are hard to make and at certain points you just can't make any changes to the script or whatever. But this is why voiceover gets used to fix the plot hole. <laughs> you know, this is why you record, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, off-screen dialogue yeah. like, you know, um, boss, I think there's a train coming. Oh good, you know, throw me some ma- throw me some grenades. Like I don't know, that would be yeah, a terrible yeah. solution, yeah, yeah. but at the very least 
it would it puts it in the world and it makes it make sense yeah Yeah, i just i I I just think i don't understand how it gets through that many people because yeah films cost a lot of money great grant it's going to cost more to fix this later sure but scripts are read by a lot of people before they get approved everybody Mm -hmm. who read that script for skyfall and everybody who read that script for Rise of Skywalker before it made its way to getting, you know, going into pre-production had a lot, mm-hmm. has a lot to answer for. I agree. You know? And, uh, you know, it's, it's very easy to kind of sound a little bit, um, a little bit sort of smug about things when you're talking about plot holes, I think. And, you know, I, I spend my time, a lot of time on, on YouTube and things, you know, people listening to people talk about stuff like this and, and, you, and, but it is, but it, it it shouldn't it's not it's not smug it's it's disbelief and it is and it is that thing of it is that thing of course it's difficult of course it's hard of course things are going to slip through sometimes but the that's not an excuse that's a reason but it's it's, it's it, saying, you know i i want to make it clear like you say yeah it, it can sound really smug and it can sound like well it's very easy to armchair direct these things right no no i'm a professional screenwriter i know how this process gets done you're a professional screenwriter you know how this stuff doesn't slip through the cracks very easily it is a lack of consideration for this stuff to slip through the cracks it is you not giving a shit and it's and it's you just say well it doesn't matter you're overthinking it no no the audience you're disrespecting the audience when you write like that if you wanted to give me a character in a bond film or in a Star Wars, like people complained like when Ray picked up the lightsaber and was able to use it really easy. I didn't care about that because I'm like, what we got in exchange was this amazing lightsaber battle. That felt really cool. And it looked amazing and all that. And I would rather just switch off the part of my brain that says, how did she learn to use this weapon so effectively? That doesn't matter. I don't care. She's able to, so let's just go with it. But it's, there are certain things in these movies, like the stuff, I, the examples I've given, that like literally don't work on any level whatsoever. The, the, mm-hmm. the ask for the audience is just too much. Yeah. You know, it's, so, it's, yeah. it's, a, case of, it's a case of kind of, it's, it's suspension of disbelief versus missing things. And you, you, there is there is just innately a, a suspension of disbelief that has to happen when you are watching a film. You are watching a story being told uh, using a character that you, an actor that you saw in something else two minutes ago. You know it's not that person, so you have to just suspend disbelief to make that weapon. And yes, yeah, sometimes um, you know sometimes things will happen, and it's a bit convenient, the moon and whatnot. You know, sometimes that's the case. But that's not. That doesn't mean that you should rest on your laurels there and go. Oh well, everyone else is doing it, so I might as well as well. You know, and I think that's the, speaking of you, kind of the educational uh, element of this of this conversation. It is. It's so important that those tropes and those things that you see on the big screen, just because it's on a big screen, just because it's it's something that has been made by professionals that you're studying or or this that and the other it doesn't mean it's always great and we all know that and we all you know we all know that but it's important to really understand that um the rise of skywalker for example was just plagued with um production issues and that's uh, that's not a hot take you know that that's 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 very well known that um that there were huge problems in making that film and this is the kind of thing that happens when you when you get things like that, you get massive narrative leaps. You get um, huge plot contrivances and plot holes occur because you've got, you know, it's al- almost the antithesis of what you're saying. But it's too many people getting involved can sometimes also allow for these things to happen. It's people in the wrong places at the wrong times, whereas you need people in the right places at the right time. You need the the writers to be able to do their thing, people to pick up on it point out these problems, point out these plot holes, and then it be carried up the chain and enact out that vision that the writer, the director, the actors have got, rather than having, um, you know, potentially studio executives saying, no, no, but wouldn't it be cool if the Death Star was in it? And you go, well, how are we going to make that happen? It was atomized. It, it doesn't exist anymore. How are we supposed to make, oh, well, I get, okay, how's she going to get there? Well, I guess a dagger, I don't know. You know, that's, that's when you, that it's, 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 you know, it's funny. Yeah. That's <laughs> when I was a kid, 
first time I saw Return of the Jedi, I thought it was the same Death Star as the first one. I thought, oh, it's it's you know just it's what was left of it. You know, it's this kind of blown. Yeah, yeah. They blew up this chunk of it. You know, it was like I don't know six or seven, and. Sure. And it's funny because now when you watch Rise of Skywalker, they're literally using that same logic that yeah. I used when I was six years old to explain yeah. what I'm seeing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so anyway. Uh, anyway. Yeah. Uh, so, Marcus, we're going to have to wrap this up. Uh, I thought that Absolutely. was very cathartic, but I'm also now very I angry agree. and I need to chill out a bit. I know. Um, I um, I feel like I need to go and uh, I need to go and watch some uh, watch some Star Trek to make myself feel better and, and realize that I do like that show again. Um, and, uh, and then maybe watch something else as well just to, yeah, but I do feel better for, I feel, I feel better for the rant. Thanks for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Let's we'll do have to do this again. Tomorrow. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, thanks very much for listening guys. And, uh, as I said before, do check out, uh, our website, scriptdepartment.net. Hit us up on social media links in the description and do subscribe to the podcast. Give this video a like and leave some comments as well for your pet peeves are. Uh, in screenwriting and maybe we'll get perhaps, to them um, at another episode perhaps you can go through some of our back catalogue and see if we do any of the things that we have uh, listed as pet peeves here that might know, be interesting yeah, yeah. there's uh, going to be loads of that that yeah. might be quite, <laughs> oh 100% 100% but you you said you didn't like this but you do it here oh. I know it's going to happen now All thanks right. Marcus for that thanks um, okay guys be open <laughs> catch, you, catch you at the next episode